So, welcome to the show. I am joined by my guest, Dr. Michael Rudadaria. He is joining us from Long Island, New York, and he wants to talk to us about uh, anxiety today. How, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for joining me. So, so we're talking about anxiety today, right? Yeah. Um, and you're coming at it from like a, your functional neurology, a functional medicine perspective. Mm -hmm. um, before we dive into it too deeply, I am curious about what got you into this field? What got you interested in working with patients with anxiety, especially from these two lenses? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I started out, obviously, in chiropractic and functional neurology in the 90s mm -hmm. and have been through the Carrick Institute program multiple times because it's evolved and changed so many times throughout the years. And then I uh, was very much interested in functional medicine. It was always part of my practice, you know, functional nutrition and things like that. And there was just, you know, there's just such a, a natural fit for both of these things because when we look at patients, we obviously look at them as, as a whole human being versus individual parts. And I was very much involved in the, I took the neurochemistry program, um, you know, back in the day with uh, Brandon Brock and uh, through the Carrick Institute and, you know, was always very much interested in, in the neurology and the biochemistry of the brain. So I would see patients from, you know, children with autism to people with Alzheimer's disease. So I always had a very, um, very mixed type of practice. And, you know, some people were more neurologically based, some people were more biochemically based. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I had a patient who came in to see me and his name's Alex. And I got a call from one of my patients actually. Um, and she said, my best friend's son uh, needs to see you, you know, very badly. He's in really bad shape. And I said, sure, no problem. And she goes, no, he needs to see you tonight. And I said, all right, you know, after hours, you know, have him come down. And she said, his mom's going to bring him down. He's 23. He's got terrible anxiety and depression. And, you know, he's really suffering. So that night, you know, in walks this young man, 23-year-old guy and, and his mom. And, um, you know, looked, looked terrific, actually, to me. And we sat down and started discussing, you know, what was happening with him. And I said, you know, tell me about yourself. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, you know, I'm 23. I graduated from college. I have a really good job, I have a girlfriend, um, I play guitar in a rock band and we just got signed to a record label. Mm -hmm. I'm like, really? And he says, yeah, but I have horrible anxiety and terrible depression and I feel I have thoughts of, of killing myself, like mm -hmm. pretty much dead. And so, you know, it was this you know, real need to help this guy to really dive in and figure out, well, you know, what is actually happening? So, you know, clinical exam and blood, urine, stool and genetic tests and you know, really dug in and found some significant imbalances throughout his system. And three months later, this guy was all better after eight years of suffering. Mm -hmm. And he wrote an article about it and they're turning it into a documentary. Amazing. It's called Food Equals Mood. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm really, really blessed to be involved with it. And uh, he's, he's a terrific young man. His name's Alex Lodani. And, um, it's uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan, who's an integrative psychiatrist in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman, who's like the father of functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. And Dr. Frank Lipman. So, you know, these are some, some you know, heavy hitters in the field. And we got together and, and put together, you know, like a trailer for this, this documentary that we're working on. So it's really exciting because we get to look at anxiety and depression and what they call mood disorders from a very, very different perspective, mm -hmm. you know. You know, these things are considered, quote, unquote, psychiatric illnesses. And, you know, in our country, you go to a doctor, they give you a diagnosis, and then they look up an algorithm that says, well, for this diagnosis, we use this drug. And this, this, this approach had failed this young man multiple times, and as it fails most people because they're really just looking to treat the symptoms. Yeah. So from our perspective as functional neurology docs and functional medicine, we get to really dig in and figure out why. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So in this particular case with this young man, um, I guess without spoiling the movie, can you talk about maybe some details of what, what the key factors for oh, his uh, anxiety? That, there, that, that's the crazy thing is that there are so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you really need to cast a pretty wide net in yeah. order to figure out what's happening with each patient. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, you know, we see a lot of times these patients have had previous head trauma. 
-hmm. So we see changes in eye movements and balance systems and, and other brainstem concomitants. And from a chemical perspective, we could see, we look for things called MTHFR gene mutations. Mm -hmm. And we look at how their folate metabolism is. And we look at their microbiome through stool testing. And we look at nutrient density. And we look at, you know, metabolism of fats and, and, uh, and proteins and so on. So when you, when you really kind of get a, a good lay of the land as to what's going on with the patient, then you put them into a rehabilitation program, both from a, a brain-based rehab program, chiropractic care, eye movements, balance training, all the different functional neuro approaches, as well as you know things like intermittent fasting and gut-based rehab programs. You know, sometimes we're looking at detox heavy metals, maybe look at parasitic infections or overgrowth of bad bacteria, you know, dysbiotic situation. So, so many different parameters, but this guy made a dramatic 180 in a very short period of time, and I'm just very, very happy for him that he's he's literally all better. Great. Yeah. And so, so so he's featured in this movie. He's uh, featured. Okay. So can you tell us uh, more about when uh, when this is coming out? How we can watch it? Uh, yeah, we're, we're still working on it right now. Mm -hmm. It's um, you know what we're trying to do is the producers are are looking to expand to bring in other patients and then have the documentary actually track patients throughout from you know from day one in the in the clinic mm -hmm. to you know what's actually happening with them as they're going through these different treatments and so on and and their experiences. So it's really going to be more of a um, you know, like a process over time, not just our explaining, you know, what, what is anxiety, depression, gut issues, and so on. That's what we did already. We already have, that's part of the trailer is myself and the other docs kind of going through that. Yeah. But these, these problems are so common in our society, mm -hmm. you know, from, from children to, you know, to the elderly, anxiety and depression seem like an, a gigantic ep epidemic. And there's so many potential causes, you know, even, even non-native EMF, you know, changes brain pretty significantly. And, you know, since we're all addicted to technology, you know, we're seeing more and more of these things and we really need to be, you know, taking a proactive approach to that. Okay. Uh, can you go into that a little more, uh, the, uh, the EMF and the causes of anxiety there? Yeah. So we know that they're doing uh, work in Stanford University where they're shining different frequencies of light in people's eyes and they're getting different hypothalamic um, hormonal secretions. Mm -hmm. So we know that light is like a drug mm -hmm. and we need it. We need full spectrum sunlight and the brain has been used to and has evolved over time to be locked into a circadian rhythm. And because now we live in you know such a high-tech world, we lose that circadian biology to a certain degree because the brain doesn't really distinguish day from night anymore. Mm -hmm. So right now, here it is, you know, in New York, it's you know 9.15, it's dark out, but I'm in a well-lit room looking at a computer screen and I have this overflow of blue light. Right. So what I do is I'll wear blue blocking glasses. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, after dark, what I'll do is I'll put on lenses that actually blue, you know, are, are like blue blocking, and it cuts out this overstimulating frequency, which is most prevalent in technology, like fire, you know, um, cell phones and computers, indoor lights, and so on. So it reduces the overstimulation of the brain, which then allows the brain to get back into a normal rhythm when you have morning sunlight. Yeah. So it's just evolutionary biology and it's real basic, but yet it seems to be like so alternative, you know, like, oh my God, you're going to go outside, you know, like that's, that's treatment, you know, but this, <laughs> this is how our body evolved. This is how, you know, this is how nature intended us to live and we're, we're not living in accordance with nature. And as a result, we end up with all these chronic illnesses. Absolutely. And then just uh, piggybacking off of this topic right now with the blue blocking glasses, I know a lot of uh, devices are equipped with night shift. Do you feel like that is a viable yeah, alternative? Or? It's better. It's better than regular, but mm -hmm. you know, or there there are different things. Like after dark, you should try to limit as much blue light exposure as possible. So this, you know, these these lenses, and and I have no, um, you know, I have no connection to the company, but I like these from a company called Blue Blocks, mm -hmm. and they block a hundred percent. But during the day, if I'm working like on my computer, I can block 30%. Okay. So, you know, and I try, like my kids are on their phones or on their iPads at night, and I try to get them to wear, you know, these inexpensive, you know, $10 blue blocking glasses that you get on Amazon. And, you know, it's, it, it prevents potential issues. Mm -hmm. So from a, a neurophysiological perspective, we can, we can reduce or downregulate some of this overstimulation 
by too much blue light, which we're all surrounded by. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, uh, so you had mentioned you look into uh, the functional medicine, the functional neurology side of uh, what causes anxiety. We know the, the digital, the EMF, the blue light, that, uh, that can ramp it up. What are right. some maybe neurological imbalances that we can touch on or maybe some, uh, some issues with diet that you've seen with people who tend to have anxiety or depression? Right. So these these mood mood based issues mm-hmm. are emotional, but they're not primarily emotional all the time. And you know, so you can have this ongoing physiological imbalance and then develop anxiety as a result. Like people who have vestibular disorders or they have vertigo, they become anxious because of alterations in the in the way the vestibular system is integrating with the cortex. Mm-hmm. So you know, looking at these things and being able to identify changes in eye movements like saccades and pursuits and virgins can really help us to understand the dynamic of the brain. And so we can actually rehab those things, which is really cool. From a biochemical perspective, you know, the microbiome is, is gigantic. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the overall flora that lives within us. You know, years ago, it used to be thought that all bacteria was bad. And there was this rampant overuse of antibiotics. So I remember when my oldest son was, was a, a baby, a little boy, my wife would just call the pediatrician and say he had a cough, and they would just call in antibiotics over the phone without even seeing him. So, you know, what's crazy is at this point, we've realized that, wow, not all bacteria is bad. In fact, we have a symbiotic relationship with trillions of bacteria that live inside of us. Mm-hmm. And for every one human cell, we have 10 bacterial cells. So we're actually not even fully human. We're actually only one-tenth human and nine-tenths bacteria. Mm. So an imbalance in this creates a gut-brain connection that becomes altered. Yeah. So now, even in the psychology literature, they're talking about microbiome imbalances and anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's really cool to be on our side of it because, you know, we're functional docs mm-hmm. and we're to influence this through, you know, non-medical means, which is really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so obviously diet plays a big role into uh, the gut flora and the, the good bacteria, the bad bacteria. What, right. uh, what's a typical diet that you might want to steer clear of or to uh, gravitate towards in order to promote a healthy gut flora? That's a great question. I mean, diversity is really key. You know, diversity in gut bacteria is really important. But the, the key really is to try to ascertain what's going on because somebody might have uh, an, an over growth of bacteria in the small intestine, and they call that SIBO, or small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And the first step is actually to get rid of that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's, you know, it's a, it's a neurological as well as biochemical problem because you end up with decreased motility of the gut and you lose some of the activity of the peristaltic activity of the gut and it allows for this overgrowth to take place, complicated by diet and so on or somebody who has head trauma. The research says that within 12 hours of having a head injury, you have a leaky blood-brain barrier and you develop a leaky gastrointestinal barrier, or a leaky gut. And it allows for, you know, proteins to become, you know, you know crossing the blood, uh, the, the, into the bloodstream and creating antigens mm-hmm. that now cross the blood-brain barrier and then cause a vicious cycle between brain and gut. So it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. But the, the amazing thing about it is if you understand the big picture and you're not so locked in on the anxiety, then you can kind of peel away each layer. And I work with two great psychologists. So, you know, because we, we want to handle the emotional piece too, because you could have somebody who has, let's say, emotional trauma as, as a child and they develop anxiety as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And then that neurological dysfunction that is anxiety can then lead to other changes physiologically. But it can happen the other way around too. You can have these changes physiologically that create anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we we always want to hit it from both angles and say, hey, we we acknowledge your feelings. This isn't just, this isn't all in your head. Mm -hmm. This isn't all in your gut. We really need to kind of look at both so we can help you manage the stress and be able to deal with the physiological issues at the same time to unwind this whole situation. You know, but everybody has stress, but not everybody has anxiety. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be some kind of, you know, um, in-between factor that needs to be, you know, looked at. 
and that's where we come in with all these different approaches from a functional, you know, neurological and, and biochemical perspective. Absolutely. And uh, we had talked with previous guests about uh, you know primitive reflexes possibly being there. Um, you know, you look at these adverse childhood experiences like you had touched on. Uh, do you see those correlating or present often with uh, people with anxiety? Yeah, oh, all the time. I mean, you know, somebody that has a high ACE score will definitely have, you know, a significant increase in, in their risk for, you know, depression later on in life. There's also a, a genetic predisposition, and we can look for things called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms to, to actually look at how these neurotransmitters are generated in our brain mm -hmm. and in our, you know, throughout our biochemistry. So things like MTHFR and MAO and COMT are three pretty important uh, gene, you know, genes that actually can be quote unquote mutated to create changes in the way our body produces certain enzymes that allow for these reactions to take place. So if you genetically don't make a, a significant amount or a sufficient amount, I should say, of dopamine and serotonin, or your body can't break those things down into you know their metabolites, then you throw in stress, you throw in diet, you throw in injury, you throw in all these other things, and you're now like in a perfect storm for having you know uh, an anxiety or, or depression issue. Absolutely. And then from I guess a biochemical and a lifestyle uh, standpoint, how do you kind of break that cycle for these these people? So, you know. It depends on what's going on with the patient. You know, mm -hmm. generally what we see is when you when you have these kinds of issues, you have a very often very low motivation. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to be motivated when you just don't feel good. Yeah. And when that's the case, you're, you're usually not exercising, you're usually not eating right, and then it just becomes that vicious cycle where one thing kind of complicates the other. So we have to really look at the lifestyle, we have to look at diet, we have to look at exercise habits, we have to look at self-esteem, and all these different pieces all come together to give to give us as clinicians a good idea of where this patient's at and what kind of approach do we need to take with them. Mm -hmm. How much of this is emotional, how much of this is biochemical, how much of this is neurological, and then we need to put a lifestyle plan in place. I tell them all the time, you need a program, not a pill. Yeah. By working together closely, and by making changes each week, we'll see really significant changes in your life and how you feel. And Absolutely. been tremendously, tremendously successful in turning these people around. Great. It takes a leap of faith on their end because you know they when they come in they're thinking that we're just going to write a prescription for them. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know it's a lot usually. More than that. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so we we usually attract very motivated people, usually who have been through the mill already, unfortunately, and. Mm -hmm. You know they're, they're at the end of their rope so they're willing to take a risk and try on this new approach because you know most people have become indoctrinated into the medical approach which is you know you don't you're not responsible all you have to do is take a pill mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you know we're saying you know you really need to look at how you're living I mean you know people do what they do because they like what they do they yeah. eat what they eat because they like what they eat now all of a sudden these are potential causative or contributory factors and we need to change them it's not easy for somebody who doesn't feel good and who's unmotivated. So yeah. that's why a lot of hand-holding needs to take place for people to be successful in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, what are some ways that uh, you do find that are successful in getting these people to motivate to do the tasks that you, you want or live the life that you want them to? Well, people are motivated by one of two things. Mm -hmm. They either want to move away from pain or they want to move toward pleasure. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to understand which which motivation each patient has. You know, smaller in my in my experience, smaller groups of people are motivated by moving toward pleasure. More people are motivated by moving away from pain. So you know, you create you create a scenario and say, you know, how how is living like this going to help your family? Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to create a little bit more of a painful scenario to help them see like just how bad things are, because. You know, when you're in that state, a lot of times it just becomes your normal and you don't realize how bad things are because you're just so used to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we when we get that, you know, test back, a lot of times inflammation is at the root of a lot of these issues. So now we're saying, hey, we have a, an elevated high sensitivity CRP or ESR or homocysteine level. And these things now can create heart disease and cancer and diabetes and all these other issues. So by fixing these physiological problems, 
by you changing the way you're living, not only can we help you reduce the anxiety, but we can also help reduce risk of further, you know, for, you know, physiological issues down the road. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it's a case by case. There's no. I wish there was a, a cookie cutter approach. Yeah. You could say, hey, here it is, but you know, really to do it right, you know, it's it's very much hands on, and it's it's so much fun because the patients are so unique, and their personalities are so unique. So for me, every single day is exciting because it's a new challenge. Mm -hmm. I never know what I'm going to see and you know every patient has had you know needs something different from me yeah. so i'm able to you know use different levels of expertise and then different communication skills to actually help each patient move forward right yeah which keeps your your job interesting and uh yeah it really does and and very rewarding because when yeah. you see somebody like this young man alex who had been suffering for eight years he, he only told me when he first came in that he was that he was dealing with this for two or three years but when he was better He's, he acknowledged that it was eight years that this poor guy was, you know, all through high school and all through college, he was having these these thoughts and you know it was it was just he was suffering in silence. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. So you know, and when you when you not when you don't know what that's like, and then you meet somebody who's who's living that way, it's really sad. And you you become as a as a doc, you become more motivated to want to help them because you realize, wow, they're they're so stuck that they can't even help themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, something you had mentioned earlier, uh, you touched on exercise a little bit and you talked um, talked about inflammatory markers and stuff and how that relates to uh, anxiety. Um, I feel like more and more research is coming out about uh, the positive benefits of, uh, of exercise on mental health. Um, can you touch on how you incorporate that uh, in your clinic and maybe the positive benefits you've seen of exercise versus a sedentary lifestyle? So we know that the frontal cortex reduces sympathetic overdrive. Mm -hmm. Part of the part of the you know the responsibility of the brain, especially the frontal system, is to suppress the, the IML in the spinal cord, which reduces the over the overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. And generally people who are anxious are in the fight or flight mechanism all the time. So when you're in this mode where your body is switched on all the time and you're and highly anxious, it's a lot of times a reflection of the fact that your frontal cortex is kind of squashed. It's not working as well as it should. Mm -hmm. And so different things that will drive the body, core exercises and you know muscle strengthening, weight lifting, all these different things, Pilates, you know, incredible yoga, they all have a tremendous input into the cerebellar cortices which you know will then feed forward the whole cerebellum feeds forward into the frontal system and ramps up frontal lobe function and what we see is that we get you know like the brain becomes more awake and so once the brain in the frontal system is more awake it can then suppress the sympathetic drive and reduce this overstimulation of the, the sympathetic nervous system and things calm down mm -hmm. so I mean it's it's very straightforward we need a few things we need sunlight, we need exercise, we need water, we need air, we need food, and you know, we need love. And when you get, just when you, we think about just getting back to basics, instead of making everything so complicated, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Yeah. Um, our, uh, our patient base is uh, a, lot, a lot of post-concussion. We see a lot of that in our clinic. Um, a lot of times with post-concussion syndrome, uh, we also see anxiety as a, as a, you know, a concomitant factor. Um, is that something you've seen, and uh, what are some steps that you've taken, especially in the, uh, the post-concussion world, uh, to uh, alleviate that anxiety? Yeah, so, you know, the, when you have a head trauma, you know, all bets are off. Everything changes. Everybody so has an entirely different sequelae, I guess you would say. Um, some people, I mean, I just examined a, a college baseball player the other night who had his second concussion and really did a very thorough workup. And this guy was really intact. Where I've had other people that had one concussion, a relatively mild concussion, and, you know, it took them a year to, be, to recover. And they had, you know, everything from, you know, headaches to dizziness to, um, you know, 
imbalance, anxiety, depression, you know, all, all different kinds of things. So the brain is so is so unbelievably complicated that when you have somebody that has a head injury or concussion, you really need to take a step back and look at the whole picture and look at their chemistry and the, and the neurology because you can't really separate the two. Mm-hmm. So it's a very similar approach except with the, with the concussion patients, there's a lot more rehab that goes into it, you know, looking to reestablish, you know, the, the pathways that, you know, have been damaged as a result or, or created dysfunction as a result of the injury. And a lot of times what we see when you have a head injury, you have a moment of rotation that creates a, a change in the way the brainstem works. So although the contusion or the, the, the injury to the cortex might heal, what we see is this ongoing pattern of dysfunction coming from the brainstem. Mm-hmm. So we need to be, you know, rehabbing that. So it creates that conduit from body to body to brain and brain to body. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Dr. Grudadaria, this has been really great so far. Um, but we're just about out of time. I wanted to make sure we have enough time for any closing remarks, and then for you to uh, to let us know how you can uh, how our listeners can get in touch with you. Then, great. Well, listen, I you know. I'm on a mission to try to make a huge positive impact on as many people as possible. That's that's my purpose. Mm-hmm. And so spreading the news about the type of work that we do and, and the, the incredible opportunity we've been given by being trained in functional neurology, functional medicine, chiropractic, and nutrition, all the different things that we've been able to put together, it, it creates hope for people. And hope is something that many people have lost. So you know, I just wanted to say that if anybody wanted to reach out or check out more about me, they can look up. On my website, it's called theoptimumu.com, T-H-E, optimum, and the, the letter U.com, and they could see me and, you know, what I'm, what I'm all about, and they can find out a little bit more um, information about this Food Equals Mood film. It's on my YouTube channel, and, um, you know, I look forward to just continuing to further the, the narrative on, you know, changing the way the, that people are taken care of, you know, with all these different chronic neurological and biochemical issues that, that you know were like a scourge on our society yeah absolutely what, what was your YouTube channel again by the way um, it's dr. Michael Grudadoria and you could get there through the optimum you okay perfect All well right. this was great I think uh, I think uh, our listeners are gonna really value what you had to say and the complexity of what anxiety is and the different components that come into it and how it's not such a cookie cutter thing and there's really a lot of factors that play into that. Uh, so I think that was a huge takeaway. I am. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been your host from the Neuro Wellness Podcast, Dr. Kappas. Be well. Mm-hmm.